I'll tell you, anywhere you have to go on a ship, that makes it so much cooler. But it's really appropriate that we are taking a ship to go see the largest naval cannon ever installed on a shore battery during World War II. After so many of you told me I had to go visit Battery Vala, Christians and Norway, I'm finally on the way. The second largest cannon installed during World War II, still in its place. 1940, when the Germans managed to invade Norway just one day before the British were going to do the same thing, they immediately set up building huge coastal forts all the way along the coast of Norway, and eventually at the end of the war, 377,000 Germans surrendered. Here at Battery Vala, initially 1,400 people worked on these forts, 750 Norwegians, 350 Danes, and 300 Germans. They constructed four enormous cannon pits with the mounting of 38 centimeter naval gun, the same as on the Bismarck. First test firing began in 1942. Eventually, 750 Germans, mostly sailors, were stationed here throughout the war, and building never stopped. They had a huge Spielgebiet of over 10 square kilometers, surrounded by bunkers, pillboxes, tobuks, minefields, and fighting positions. There were also 18 other smaller cannon positions, flak, and 2.3 kilometers of narrow gauge railroad, and they needed it because the shells for these enormous cannons weighed between 500 to 800 kilos. Now, the fascinating thing about Norway is the way the Germans utilized nature for camouflage. Well, first impression is that I slept in the car. I got here late last night, way after dark, so I had no idea what I was looking at. But standing down here, first thing about Norway, it's a beautiful country. Second of all, there's a lot of rock and stone that makes fortifications, I'm not gonna say easy to build because building a fort is never easy, but you have a lot of rock. Makes for good camouflage. The rock is very protective. I'm curious to see how they have utilized that in the design here. But the fort we see in Denmark should be built roughly the same. But this is not the same. It's built in rock. This is the secondary fire control bunker. We're gonna hide in here until the rain stops. That's the first German bunker I've been in that's built in Norway. That looks very authentic. Everything looks real. And you have the wood on the walls, like it would be. On the floors. Some of the original fittings, I'm sure. And I'm pretty sure that was not a bathroom. I think that is a cable duct. Hangers. Where is to be? It's a small, this is a small crew compartment where the crew would be. All the fixtures and hooks are in place. Very cool, very cool. This is very cool to see. And here, this is what you start with. You start with the wood in the walls, then with the wooden pegs, then the wooden board, so everything would hold in place. It would do a lot for insulation. It gets cold, and it would get cold here. And it does a lot for noise insulation, which is definitely a thing. Communications hats. The four guns were directed by a 12 meter range distance fighter out here in one of the islands on Flekkehoi. Impression of the weather. Secondary firing control. If the main one is knocked out. This does not appear to be as flimsy as the secondary fire control at Henstholm was. Just my observation. Plus, it is built into the rock side, the face of the rock here, utilizing the natural rock for protection. And that is exactly what I expected to see here in Norway. And I've talked about how the Germans did this in many places where you had this as an option. This is the kind of weather 
that turns, comes and goes, it comes and goes. It'll not last long and I, honestly, I came too far and I spent too much money to go see this and show it to you. I, I can't hide in a bunker. It's just because things get wet, so. And there it is, the last final remaining 38 centimeter land-based cannon from World War II. The barrel alone weighs 110 tons. It had a range of 55 kilometers. Facing an opposite identical battery in Henstom, do visit my episode from Henstom, the two forts could lock down all sailing in the Kattegat. Of course, the center, where they had a few kilometers to spare, was buttoned up by 18,000 sea mines. On my video in Henstom, you all wrote me that I had to come here and see this. I am really glad you did, and to do a bit of change of plans. To come see this is an amazing experience because of all the World War II architecture, of the fighting positions, of the cannons and artillery, most of it is gone, disappeared in disarray. This restoration is amazing because it really gives you an idea of what was. And of course, sitting right across from here, whereas Hensholm is right over there, across the waters, and the Germans will be able to protect the Kattegat. My name is Stian Engner Lunde. We're now at uh, Mervik Fort, Batteri Vara, which is uh, an authentic German fortress built in uh, the beginning of uh, World War II, uh, which has been uh, left over in the hands of the museum, where volunteers slash the museum of uh, Vestagda uh, are working to keep the memory from the war alive and show people uh, a little bit about uh, how the German fortresses worked. We have the second largest land mounted cannon in the world, which is a 38 centimeter SKC 34 uh, naval gun on the roof here. This is uh, the munitions bunker. Uh, and in the fortress area, we have uh, bunkers, uh, barracks, an old casemate, uh, we have a, a railway is working. Uh, so we try to, to keep the, the memory alive of, of uh, how it was being occupied by the Germans in, uh, in the south of Norway. The turret with the cannon installed weighs 337 tons. And the first thing that jumps out at me is just exactly how large it is. This is physically larger than the one you'd see on a battleship. We are going inside the turret, and afterwards I'll show you how much space there is in the turret of the USS Alabama, just for comparison. Looking at the landscape, it's almost impossible to tell from a distance what is a camouflaged bunker camouflaged with a rock, and what is just a rock outcropping. It is so amazing. And one of the best things that I always get, take some pleasure out of is seeing the weather protection, the tar that all the Germans put on all their bunkers to protect them from the weather. Believe me, Scandinavian weather puts a lot of rain and wind and damage on exposed cement. So this is necessary and it's good to see it in place. And a few years ago, the museum repainted the cannon in the original paint scheme and the original colors from World War II. They found them up there in the casemate that was built over turret number one, although it never arrived. And this is the details that really sets this museum apart. They really went out of their way. And believe it or not, even though it's living memory still, just getting the paints right or finding out what they were is sometimes impossible. Just a hell of a thing. You have a lot of hooks, a lot of attachments for camouflage netting that we've seen. And obviously this rail is post-war for safety. But you just look at the countryside. And Christian Sen is in there, where we sailed in last night. And yes, it is really that windy up here. You have the cannon, and you have the rail 
running to one is a warehouse and up to the other bunker here. And there's an ammunition train that ran between the two magazines and the four gun turrets, just like the one that chased us in Hensholm. It's interesting because we always said there's no verticals and squares in nature, except when there are. And if you live in Utah or in rocky mountainous terrain, you know that rocks sometimes take on very strange shapes. In the forest, no, there are no straight lines. But in a mountain, yeah, there might be straight lines. I'm counting a lot of the straight lines here are either bunkers or they're just rocks. And it's really interesting because all these bricks were all the foundation of the heavy duty crane they would need to install, lift the enormous cannon in there. And with a barrel that weighed over a hundred tons, they needed an extremely heavy duty and mobile crane to lift these cannon barrels into position. So they had to construct the transport mechanism for the crane in order to find something big enough that can lift heavy enough to get the cannon into the bunker. Originally, there was four identical exposed cannon pits, but here, gun number one, they decided to build an enormous casemate to surround gun number one, although gun number one never actually arrived and only parts of it had arrived at the end of the war. This enormous casemate had 4.5 meter thick roofs, 3.6 meter thick walls, and remember this as we go through it, it only took them 10 weeks to build it. Now, World War II was the first war that saw massive aerial bombing campaigns, and that was a large concern of the Germans, especially when they had forces like this. That's why they built this enormous casemate. Of course, that would limit the arc of fire for the cannon, but it was deemed worth it to expend that much. Now, the cannon barrel itself was designed and built by Krupp in Essen, and for some reason it was discarded as not satisfactory or available for use, and therefore never sent up here to Norway with the other bits and pieces. The trip here went over Denmark through Sweden for the barrel to finally get here. Now you have one cannon like this in France that were installed, but if you go to the site in France, unlike here, there's no enormous cannon cannon museum that you'll see. That makes Mervik a unique experience, a must-see. See, this is almost partially the same. This is half of an open turret casemate, just enclosed. You have the same design, the same well, and you have oh, that probably used to be close protection, possibly. Oh, here you go. Here's a little two sitting up there. Not that the little two would be up there. Not that I honestly would want to sit there with a 38 centimeter cannon flying right next to me. I know the hearing protection in the military is not optimal today. I'm pretty damn sure it wasn't back then. Now you have for armor door, there's room for hinges and we could be seeing, ooh, we're not seeing anything unless I turn on the light now, are we? Here we go. Here's up to another little Tobruk. So on both sides of the cannon, nicely and symmetrical, and I would imagine this would be communication. Maybe a little ammunition storage for the machine gun. So on both sides of the cannon, there's a little room with a machine gun on top, as there should be. Home defense. This is exactly the same mounting center 
as in the open pit. And if you look at the walls inside the casemate here, this is where they found the original paint colors that they used to paint the main cannon. There's an open door, we're going through it. Obviously this was armored. Oh, look at this. The rubber is still, the seal is. I'm not sure this is not still functional, but this is a beautiful seal on the gas tight doors. It has been atrocious weather. Ever since the drone flew away in the storm yesterday, well, I couldn't fly it over here anyway, so all there is to do is seek refuge inside underground tunnels from the weather. You know, the traditional wet underground tunnels. So this is the pit underneath. You see the elevators, or the loaders where the munition would be stored. Hand it over onto the carts. These are the ammunition carts from Henstholm in Denmark. And from there loaded on to the cannon. A lot of the original fittings and attachments and closed doors and I thought they knew I was coming. Well, they knew I was coming. And I thought they had by now known that I don't like locked doors. In fact, they infuriate me, especially locked doors of history. This is plated up as well. All right, we'll take a walk. This is... All right, well, we've got dual rails. I do not remember dual rails in the Danish system. And of course, this is the part in an open 360 cannon casemate that would be open from above as well. So I'm wandering around the cannon well. Not hearing you complaining about lack of light this time, are I? I'm sensing this would once have been closed off. Now, the interesting part is, over here, I'm hoping, damn it, actually a machinery in there, that looks very original. to the right is the full view of the outside world what it would have looked like over the cannon from in here that is really something and the rows of pillars laying out in front of the casemate were the ones upon which the enormous crane would travel to install the barrel they were blown up in the 50s by Norwegian engineers as a training maneuver I wish they wouldn't this is all new this is where the rail would have been for the cannon, but what it looks like they've done, turning into a little lecture area. And honestly, if we're gonna have a World War II lecture, I can think of no better place. With a lecturer talking here, and everyone listening here, and the acoustics in here are amazing. Got a solid steel beam roof over our heads. Perfectly encased, very well constructed. And you are remembering they built this in 10 weeks, right? I don't know what lectures they're doing here, but I think it is amazing that they're doing it because this is how you keep history alive. And here is where the original hatches and rail 
this would have been for the cannon. Sometimes they'll give you key to the back places. I'll let you have the key. I'll let me play on my own. And have a look in here. What's in the back of the big casemate? It's only storage, but I'm curious to see the layout. To the door. To the inside here. The back of the casemate. In some of the bunkers they have TV screens talking about the history and the events that took place here and stories from the local area which is really cool. strange in here. There are people underneath somewhere in the pit talking and it sounds like the sound comes from everywhere. Now during World War II the Germans spent an enormous amount of time, effort and money building very large bunkers and here an enormous casemate and there's nothing more demoralizing than when somebody's air force detects it upon themselves to disassemble it with high explosives. So camouflaging it from the air, air reconnaissance became paramount. And here in Norway you still see all the metal strands and the netting upon which they would pull up the camouflage netting. You may have seen my episode from Wolfshanks about how much they made out of camouflaging Hitler's bunkers. But here you actually see the remnants of what you'd clip the camouflage onto and that is very very rare to see. They built fake trees out of metal, they had all sorts of different camouflage measures as you can see here with the original photograph from the bunker from that time. It really does blend in especially here in Norway where you had so much rock you could use as part of that active camouflage. On the roofs they had little metal trees and the cannons were painted in the right cane scheme and they were also camouflaged with netting so you could almost not see them and it would take some effort to camouflage an enormous entity like this. Well, look where you see the, it looks like a Christmas tree crawling up the wall with the camouflage netting. See very little of the weatherproofing left, just a hint of color or black tar but I'm pretty sure they're gonna the modern staircase and the original one I leave it up to your imagination as to how I got up there this is the back of the casemate rounds but and here you would have the whole back support rooms crew quarters ventilation again ventilation plays a very large part in all bunkers on all sides and this has been opened for a display of some kind up have a look at these wonderfully uh, staircase that has been repurposed. Turns out this is the back of the TV display of where I just were. The entrance road to the back of the fort and we're on top of a multi-roof structure leading up to the back of the actual cannon position there. It's a very, very large above ground 
fort and here you have the railroad entering into the bunker. So the munition bunker would be way into the forest or at least further and again if this is a close defense position natural rock have been used. And one more there. It's hard to tell. Also here's the square side of the rock. Could be caved, it could be because there's something in there. Um, well, I mean the roof layout is very interesting. There have been various different security perimeters surrounding the whole neighborhood. The whole area would have been sealed off in a spare gebiet with access control of various degrees, keeping the civilian population out. Uh, at least you're not kicking somebody out of the summer house up here. And the whole landscape under the canopies would be dotted with bunkers, communications, uh, storage, munitions. And you have one of the, the main gun that's in place here one of the other turrets rings are over there and we're standing on top of the uh, third casemate. There were four cannons, yes. Uh, the, the bunkers are built exactly alike and there are four of them scattered around this area. We're now standing by the gun who was called gun number two. Uh, about uh, maybe 100, 150 meters over there you have gun number one. That was the only one that was never finished. They built the casement uh, in, in 44. The war was almost coming to an end and they decided to build the casement over that one first. Probably because the gun wasn't finished, so they still had the big uh, traverse crane ready to put the barrel, which was the missing piece, uh, into the cannon. So they built the casement. Uh, on the other side of uh, this little valley, uh, you will find gun number three and four. Uh, which were exactly the same as this gun number two. So there were three working cannons uh, during the war. And the truly is an amazing view from up here on the casemate. And when I look around in the forests and the mountains, there are so many cannon positions. There's a flat gun position right over there that I'm looking forward to visiting next time. And weatherproofing, tar slap. And here we are, here we have a little room that is very wet. Now close defensive position and a closed door. Don't like closed doors. This we've seen before. Did I mention I don't like closed doors? And a piece of trim. So we're looking at this outside. Outside of the bunker here. One of the back entrances. But using the rock as camouflage and protection, it's brilliant. It's what you had. What else are you gonna do? You remember at the end of the war, uh, Germany still had 200,000 some troops stationed here in Norway, although there really were no fighting going on. And I always ask myself why your war, your industry is being destroyed. It wouldn't make much sense to keep 200,000 200, capable fighting troops in a backwater to the war. And this is what it was. There was no active fighting here, no invasion. The Russians weren't here, the Americans, the British. Uh, Norwegian resistance, just like in Denmark, Danish resistance, obviously. But there was healthy fighting troops that could have been deployed on the eastern and western front and actually done, uh, lent support, just like the troops in Kurland. So I always wondered why all these hundreds of thousands of troops were kept out of the fighting in preparation for the use of Norway, Denmark. Why? For what? Here in Mervik Fort, the casement, as I told you earlier, were, was fortified late 44. Uh, the, the fighting in France was really picking up. They were losing ground east and west. But still, Hitler used resources to fortify the cannons 
on, in the southern part of Norway. But Winston Churchill, he, he had a plan. Uh, of course, we all know he, he wanted to go in to France, uh, Normandy and, and everything, but he wanted to leak a plan to the Germans that they would come an allied uh, invasion uh, at the Norwegian coast. And in, in yeah, the evidence speaks for itself that Hitler, <coughs> Hitler um, took the bait. Yeah, uh, he left the soldiers and fortified forts. Had as I said, seven uh, seventeen hundred tons of ammunition yeah. laying down in a fort that hadn't been used once. Uh, yeah, sort of a waste of resources. Yeah, it it was definitely a plan, and he definitely were expecting a British invasion or an Allied invasion invasion on the coast of Norway. Yeah. You build it here and like this because it is just a lot easier to build above ground when you're on top of rock than it is to build dig into the ground. So you use what you have. I am imagining from this sign from here that this is the main fire control bunker for the cannon that's up there and the other one that will be in here. Initially I was under the impression this might have been the main fire control but I no longer see a deck. Up to the main cannon there. We'll go see what that is. Details for the track that we see everywhere. And I'm imagining even the Germans had a small repair shop for the munition train. Could have been the same place, so the tracks are original. The building is obviously newer. very short munitions carts to make that switch. Just just saying. Cannon was up there. That's a bit of a switchboard. This is why you have a small port railroad because nothing else can make these two You can camouflage everything to some degree. How you camouflage an enormous gun pit with a 38 centimeter meter cannon in it? I'm just saying, I would love to see the uh, aerial photographs of this because I, I am curious to see how exactly this was camouflaged, if that was even possible. Something, the outline must have been very hard. This is a very, very large, bigger than a ship's cannon in a huge pit seen from the air, yeah, you'd think. Maybe it's a guy thing, I'm not sure, but seeing this enormous original cannon sitting here is just really, really special. And they did so much to build this museum and bring good displays. Next episode, we're gonna go inside the gun pit. We are gonna go inside the gun, and I will show you for comparison what the inside of the ship cannon looked like. Also, there's a few surprises they're hiding from the public out here that I got to see. Just wait for it.